Welcome to Financial Repression Authority's Roundtable Insight, where the best fund managers, economists, and industry leaders discuss the key investment issues and challenges in the current macroeconomic environment. Hi, welcome to FRA's Roundtable Insight. This is Richard Benuli. Today we have Charles Hugh Smith. He's author, leading global finance blogger, and America's philosopher, we call him. He's the author of several books on our economy and society, including A Radically Beneficial World, Automation, Technology, and Creating Jobs for All, Resistance, Revolution, and Liberation, A Model for Positive Change, The Nearly Free University in the Emerging Economy, Pathfinding Our Destiny, Preventing the Final Fall of Our Democratic Republic, also Will You Be Richer or Poorer, and recently a book Global Crisis, National Renewal, A Revolutionary Grand Strategy for the United States. His blog of twominds.com is one of CNBC's top alternative finance sites. Welcome, Charles. Thank you, Richard. Well, I'm, I'm thrilled that uh, we're going to talk about my latest book, uh, which just uh, was published this past week. Uh, and I, the title is Self-Reliance in the 21st Century. And the reason why I titled it in the 21st century is um, the, the most famous essay about self-reliance, at least in, in North America, is um, titled Self-Reliance by Ralph Waldo Emerson, who wrote it in 1841. And um, in, in that era, um, Emerson was uh, describing self-reliance as independence of thought and action. And he used terminology that's quite modern, um, uh, which was uh, striking in, in that more traditionalist time. He said that we should all be um, our best selves because that's, the, that's what we alone can do is to be our best selves and to not uh, follow others' footsteps, to make our own decisions. And um, so this independence of thought and action is, is um, kind of the essential uh, foundation of self-reliance as, as Emerson was describing it. But um, the th interesting thing was back then, the economy was much more localized um, than it is today. In other words, most people uh, got their um, food, energy, water, and uh, had their work uh, right there uh, in their locale. Even if you lived in a city, um, you, your food source was within walking distance, right? <laughs> or or um, a short distance away. And you were creating a lot of the household necessities yourself or trading for them with your own labor. So that localized sort of much more self-sufficient economy is in really stark contrast to the economy we have today, which I would describe as hyper-globalized and hyper-financialized, meaning that, um, in many cases, the things that we rely on, uh, essential elements um, uh, in our lives, such as food, such as tools, um, our work, that these come from thousands of miles away. And um, we can also say that the same thing about financialization, that a lot of people are living off this, the wealth of, of what uh, you and I know is, is basically just leverage and credit it's not the creation of goods and services and jobs that's creating the wealth now, it's speculation based on leverage and credit and gaming the system, insider trading, you know, stock buybacks, you know, all that stuff. And so people are relying on that, that bubble uh, wealth and thinking that, that, they're, um, that they're going to be um, just fine. But they, there's a difference between having some money and, and being self-reliant. You know, that, that money is not necessarily self-reliance. And so, and self-reliance is not exactly self-sufficiency. You know, like um, Emerson's friend uh, Thoreau, you know, famously lived on a, a, a little cabin that he built himself on Walden Pond on land owned by Emerson, by the way. And um, he wrote about being relatively self-sufficient and by today's standards, radically self-sufficient. But he was not that what well, his skill set was not uncommon in 1841. I mean, he grew some beans, he foraged, um, he built his own, um, you know, cabin. All those skills were common in 1841. Now we have very few people have those basic 
skills of of self um, of self reliance. So I, I, you know, you and I have each um, are on our own paths to increase our self reliance. And so before we started recording, you made a really good point about the educational system, the the vast difference between then and now. Yeah, that, that's a very good point because um, the, the whole educational system has tended toward a trend of, of less thinking outside the box, which is what it should be focused on, right? Is, uh, you, know, how, uh, it, you know, teaching uh, people how to, to think outside the box, uh, thinking how to solve a problem. Um, thinking how to make diminishing resources go farther that, that that's what it's all about uh, but but instead it's it's tended to emphasize traits of um, less thinking outside the box more consensus building uh, less conflict and uh, less challenge uh, you know in terms of like a ch challenging discussions um, d debate right used to be a uh, uh, a, an essential um, facet of, of the educational system, especially like in the UK, uh, the British educational system. Uh, but nowadays, it's it's either not addressed, not not um, being really a trend to to emphasize on that, and so you end up this this sort of consensus building culture where there's there's not much skill set um, outside of um, some generic skills and that that's not that's not a good thing if we compare what happened now uh back to the great depression the u.s great depression uh at least then there was some link back to to the land you know so there was some knowledge of farming of some you know self-reliance on that basis but uh living off the land and farming but nowadays there's very little connection to that uh, larger portion percentage of the people uh, have been living in cities you know some even uh, have no knowledge of farming or gardening uh, unaware of whether vegetable growth above ground or or below ground and so <laughs> yeah it's it's just um, it's, it's not a good situation so um, so your your book is very uh, timely and and very valuable at, at this time yeah you know, Richard, again, before we started recording you, um, we were talking about the timeliness and, and I, it hadn't really occurred to me. I, I tend to think that we're entering a decade where globalization and especially hyper-globalization um, is eroding and it seems to be eroding quickly. And I think financialization is also um, unraveling. And so the two things that people depend on are um, basically melting into the sands. And so they're, they're gonna be um, in, in real trouble because they don't have any substitution for uh, what they're getting from globalization and financialization. And so what we're talking about is if you, if you make progress on, on your self-reliance now, while you still have the income and capital, it's gonna be um, better than money in the bank. <laughs> Yes. No, that's that's a very uh, important point we're discussing before the start of, of our podcast today. The idea that, you know, there still is some measure of, of currency purchasing power. Uh, some people have savings or you might have the 401k plan or, R, you know, in the U.S. or RSP plan, this similar type of setup in Canada or elsewhere. And, you know, even though the markets are going down, um, you know, there's still some purchasing power left to convert into, um, you know, sustainability, uh, self-reliance, because I think if you wait too long, uh, it could be a point in time where a lot of that asset, that phantom wealth has, has dissipated, has disappeared, and, and you no longer have as much uh, or any means 
to convert that into you know systems here that we're talking about alike are relating to food water energy transportation uh, and, and we can go you know specifically into each one uh, what you know some ideas that uh, we, we see happening that people are doing um, to increase self-reliance but yeah th this is this is the time you, you know it's 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 advised to do uh, action now uh, essentially before it's too late right and let's yeah we can um, go through the sort of essentials of life um, and um, but I'm going to preface uh, that by by mentioning that um, you know, we, uh, for a lot of people, they're going to find that the place they live in now is just not conducive to self-reliance. And, um, in other words, there's no water, you know, or it's, it's, it comes from, uh, in a canal or a pipe from a thousand miles away. <laughs> um, and, or maybe there's no energy within thousands of miles, you know, transportable energy, everything's generated elsewhere and there's no food, uh, production in their locale. And, just as important, maybe they're in a place where the local government has so many restrictions and code uh, codes and um, that that the number of permissions you need to become more self-reliant is um, prohibitive. And so, you know, you might have to move to, to a place where um, the, the number of permissions you need to do something for yourself is is lower. And that uh, of the local culture actually, you know, supports um, self-reliance and, and localized uh, production. Um, and um, so that's another reason why, you, you know, your capital might be have to put to use to actually buy, buy a place um, where self-reliance is just a lot easier. Because if you're going to pick a place where everything is just ridiculously expensive and difficult, it, it just makes your you know, your path to self-reliance that much harder. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't necessarily mean um, uh, you should move out west or, you know, where there's more wide open spaces. That's not necessarily the answer because a lot of these places out west are, you know, either desert areas, dry, there's challenges with the water supply, um, you know, level of rainfall. You know, there's certainly a lot of places back east um, in the in the eastern U.S., eastern Canada, locations where there's a sufficient uh, good amount of rainfall, lots of trees, uh, so there's lots of resources there, right? You got timber resource resources, water resources, um, and um, just a, a climate that's more conducive, right, to, to growing um, food, and, um, and 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 it's still you know very, very quiet spaces. Uh, like up in the hills, and these could be not too far from major metropolitan areas as well. No, you're absolutely right. Um, small cities, small towns, um, suburbs. It, you know, it, it, as I said, it, it depends kind of on the culture as well. If if it's like the local city or the county encourages, you know, um, home gardens and farmers markets, and um, there's local you know, nonprofits that have like 3D fabrication facilities so where people can come in and make parts for themselves. These kinds of things are just a, an enormous benefit. And it's part of the infrastructure that you want to join that's already there as opposed to going to some place where nobody grows any food, there's no gardens or the gardens are banned, you know, and, and nobody's, uh, nobody's in the maker uh, production kind of uh, mindset. You know, and of course, what we're trying to do is become productive, not just be consumers. Yeah, exactly. This is this is the whole trend now that was catapulted, especially during the COVID era, the whole migration from cities to suburbs from uh, and also to exoserfs, to farming areas or from the maybe migrating from the suburb to a farming area. This is happening um, globally, and uh, you know, especially like in the U.S., Canada, lots of people moving out of cities to to buy a few acres of land. Essentially, it doesn't have to be too far away from the city, but um, yeah, that's that's certainly the trend. As as you mentioned, uh, 
and uh, we we uh, we know a lot of people that are that are doing that as well. Uh, but both of us, we're, we're hearing stories. Uh, it's quite evident also in the real estate market. Right, right. Well, you know, you uh, we've talked a lot about energy um, and the transition to a more sustainable economy, and um, so y- you had some thoughts about um, energy um, self reliance. And, and we're, again, we're not talking about complete off grid, although, you know, in certain cases, that may be the way to go. But for for most of us, it's just providing some of what we need, as opposed to being 100% dependent on sources, you know, 1000s of miles away. Yeah. And and just just before we get into those examples, um, just to mention uh, at the outset, as we were discussing initially, is this is, is very timely now your book, um, especially given what's going on in the economy and the and the political environment. Uh, I mean, we've been through the uh, the COVID challenges, uh, and then there's this this whole World Economic Forum Great Reset that has been launched uh, dur- during this time period, um, and and it's all it's a, a lot of it is about um, uh, governments using that opportunity to get more control on on the people uh, given all the challenges with unsustainable debt and un, unsustainable um, unfunded liabilities like on the pensions is, is what's really driving it at, at the at the highest level um, and and so it all comes down to um, an answer or a theme of trying to become as independent as possible is, is the best solution to uh, you know to preserving your freedoms, your your liberties, um, and and your way of life. Um, otherwise, you know, you'll, you'll become dependent and you'll become subject to uh, control at at uh, the whims of politicians. Um, so we we like to say, uh, you know, try, try to look towards the Amish and the Mennonites as a model. Actually, of uh, I know you know many of us can't can't go to that level of self reliance, but I think that's a good uh, model to look at. Your thoughts on that, uh, Charles? Yeah, that's a that's a great example, Richard. Because when when you think of those um, lifestyles, um, the, the, you don't have to have the exact same religious faith of those groups. Because what what they do is they use very little. In other words, they consume very little from the global economy. Right? They they. Um, they make or produce much of what they consume and they rely very uh, little on globalized supply chains. And then they also rely on the community. In other words, they help each other. And and so that um, cooperation, uh, I think it's really important that we remember that that is the key um, in terms of natural selection the key advantage of of the human species is our ability to cooperate you know to share information and uh share resources and and help each other and so i think in my view self-reliance in the 21st century is to it requires going back to the community model where you don't have to produce everything yourself because someone in your community is making more of one thing that you that you could use and you're making more of something else and then you can just trade and this is this is of course a a, that's basic uh you know small-scale capitalism going back to you know the bronze age right you create a surplus and you find a way to to generate uh, a trade that that you get something that you value and uh and in exchange for what you're producing and so the key is that we're producing something and it could be um, a, a good, uh, you know, a product, or it can be a service that we can then trade in our local community, you know, and then that creates this communication, and we're helping each other, and we're lowering our reliance on global supply chains. And I'll, I'll give an example from my life. I mean, bicycles are not useful in in, in the dead of winter, of course, in many places, but. Um, it just as an example of a very simple technology. Well, during the whole COVID um, supply chain disruption, uh, I was talking to guys and, and they couldn't get uh, parts for their bicycles. You know, in other words, all these things are sourced from Taiwan or, you know, um, thousands of miles away in Asia. And so it's like, well, wait a minute, even a simple machine 
is now dependent on, on the global supply chain that is very easily broken. That's not smart. That's not a smart way to live. You know? So if you have a bicycle, number one, um, get a few spare parts for things, you know, um, and um, also start making friends with other bicyclists who then have derailers that they could, you know, swap out to your bike. And, you know, that, that kind of mentality is, you know, is the idea is, is the more we can do for ourselves and the less we consume, the less dependent we're going to be on these um, these supply chains that really make no sense in a lot of ways, and that's why they're unraveling. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, our firm Cedar Gold, uh, we we have a um, an index of great businesses from around the world that uh, we we maintain manage, and these. Uh, businesses and in, in our whole approach is is based on what's called market environmentalism. It's a set of four principles that have been distilled from the Austrian Economic Center in Vienna, Austria and the American Conservation Coalition in the US. And uh, we, we have the four principles on our website, you can actually become a signatory to those four principles. Um, but it's essentially it, it emphasizes uh, local solutions, everything you're, you're talking about, lo localized solutions, decentralized solutions, um, emphasis on property rights, like if those that have the ownership of the land are more likely to take better care of the land, right, instead of some um, unowned or government piece of land where people care less, right, than if, if it were their own. Um, also emphasis on on innovation and uh, technology solutions. So it's all it's all about um, the natural market uh, and less about agenda based uh, environmentalism. Um, and so that that's a big difference. Um, and, and we think it makes sense. It works as, as the examples you give, uh, not only in your most recent book, but in, in all of your books. Um, you, you emphasize these principles and, and examples. Uh, so that's that's really good to follow. You're right. And, and if we were just to, to uh, describe a local a localized um, productive economy, then of course, th th those principles are exactly what we um, <laughs> what we would pick, right? That's what we'd say. This is optimizing a localized, very productive economy because, you know, we're, we're not in, in shifting from being a totally dependent consumer to being a more self-reliant producer of essentials and valuable goods and services, that we're not going to be creating value, um, in, you know, in the abstract. We're going to be creating it within our own communities, right? And so, um, and and I think the the other good point that we've talked about before is that, that there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, you know, it's, it's like the, the, the bad model of capitalism is there's a, you know, one factory or one distribution center in town, and then that's it, you know, uh, you're totally dependent on one or two industries or one or two companies for, for most of the jobs. Well, that's a very fragile system. So the kind of localized um, innovation um, economy is, is like has a lot of opportunity for people like what are you interested in? Well, then, you know, um, one of Emerson's uh, sayings is, you know, do the thing and you shall have the power. In other words, just start doing it, you know? Yeah. And um, a lot of people, I, I, I think, are uh, uh, absorbing that idea and going, well, I, I, I can try a garden, right? And then they discover that it's satisfying and then it's fun to share, the, you know, the, the, what you've grown with other people. And then, and I, I want to make the point that one of the things I'm trying to emphasize in the book is do what's easy where you live. In other words, you know, um, if you live in a, a temperate climate, um, well, then grow potatoes because potatoes grow really well in poor soil and they, they you know, they're frost resistant, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, where I am, a tropical climate, well, then you grow what's easy, which for, you know, here is taro and breadfruit and, you know, things like that. And so I think we've gotten away from the idea that you grow what's easy um, and works well in where, where you are. And for a lot of places that might be dairy. I mean, there's, a, there's just so much variation, but yeah. um, the idea is do more with what you have, but do what's easy. Don't, don't do that. Don't make it hard. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. And so it, it could be a wide variety of approaches, solutions. A lot of it is 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 localized based and decentralized in that sense. Um, and so, like, if we can give some examples too on on food. I mean, not you mentioned the garden, having your own garden. There's there's also local CSA programs they call them where um, there might be a, a farm that is is being managed and run by uh, a, a group of people uh, maybe a, a bunch of students even and and they're growing a large amount of food on, on a, some piece of land uh, that they made they make available um, for like every two weeks so you can go there and you pick up your your basket your box every two weeks or maybe it's delivered to your to your home and um so that that's another way to go right so it's coming locally it's grown locally uh it's part of maybe a um some cooperative or 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 set up for for uh, community sharing so that you know that, that th those are some uh, some good examples different scenarios absolutely and and learning to like what's grown locally you know like we've we've kind of gotten spoiled to some degree and in that, um, you know, some vegetable that's completely out of season or fruit is air shipped from South America at tremendous expense. And um, you go, oh, well, you know, I, I can get grapes any time of year, you know, but is, is that really the, uh, a smart use of resources? And, and the answer is no. <laughs> so, you know, it's like um, you eat what's in season and, and um, that's one way of, of reducing your, your, um, your global footprint and your dependency on, on long supply chains. So, and um, it's also your, your health is going to improve, you know, because so much of the food that's sold by global corporations and made somewhere hundreds or thousands of miles away is processed and it's um, really not that uh, healthy. And so when you're eating real food, you're going to improve your health. And I make the point that in terms of self-reliance, our first step should be to take control of our own health and not be dependent on uh, pharmaceutical companies and you know corporations packaging um, unhealthy food. Yeah, absolutely. Um, maybe we look at some examples in transportation. So self-reliance there could be, as you mentioned, maybe you've got um, different modes of transportation to consider. First, um, first uh, priority would be, uh, I mean, you, you, a lot of people have cars, you know, so maybe you uh, try to keep some, a couple of spare tires, you know, due to supply chain shortages in the garage. Uh, maybe you have a, a, an alternative means of transportation as well, like uh, maybe a carpool sharing in the community. Oh, you have your own bicycle. Um, and also less reliance on different types of energy input into the transportation system. So maybe not just relying on gas powered vehicles, but having an electric vehicle, uh, e even considering having an e-bike. So an, an e-bike uh, is, you know, much less cost, cost uh, than, a, than an electric vehicle, of course. Um, you know, on the order of maybe one or two thousand um, dollars, more or less, and so you can get one of these e-bikes and have it ready, you know, for for transportation. And and these are the, these are getting more widely developed, uh, be, better, um, you know, more economical. Uh, distance range can go up to like seventy kilometers, uh, 40, 50 miles or so. Um, you know, so you can, you, you've got a good distance to go down to the nearest uh, Costco and pick up some, um, some, some stuff, some groceries. Uh, some of these e-bikes are actually cargo type, so you can carry a lot of stuff. They're, they're made to carry things, um, either people or, or, or items and stuff. Um, so there, there's lots of um, things that can be done there. Your thoughts, Charles? Yeah, I, I think that's a great um, uh, a great suggestion. Is it, the uh, the cargo bike, whether it's human powered or or an e bike, it, it's an example of of a technology that already exists. There's nothing particularly fancy about it, but it's just it's like hyper 
efficient compared to taking a uh, two or 3,000 pound vehicle or a 5,000 pound SUV or pickup truck and going to go buy, you know, five pounds of something. <laughs> and um, the, so the, the e-bike is, is, um, uses far less resources. And um, I'm not that familiar with, uh, with the technology, but my assumption based on just the simplicity of the basic uh, vehicle is it's, it's, more, it's more likely to be repairable. And so that's one of the big things about, um, about globalization and financialization is it's been planned obsolescence, right? Everything is now made to fail in a few years so that you have to buy another one. And this is, of course, very profitable for you know, cartels and monopolies, but it's, it's, it's a terrible waste of resources you know, of the planet. So an e-bike uses far less resources, right? The battery smaller, uses far less metals and everything. And then it's more repairable, so it's more likely to last a lot longer than um, other technologies. And yet you can still carry a tremendous amount. And in fact, I just saw Wired uh, from Wired Magazine, an article describing how when there's like an emergency um, situation, like where the power is out in a region, uh, maybe there's been a natural disaster, then cargo bikes can carry a, 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 a tremendous, uh, a consequential amount of of essentials into a place where there's uh, power has been out or, you know, there's been uh, disruption. So that's a very good example of, of, of leveraging technology, um, but in a way that uses a fraction of the resources of the current economy and yet gets better results, you know, in, in, in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And you can charge your e-bike with a, with a single panel, you know, in other words, I know uh, it's yeah. If you if you can spend like say twenty five or thirty thousand for a, a very large uh, photovoltaic system, you can you can get a system that will charge your your um, EV vehicle. But um, obviously, you know, at a, the smaller the scale, the more likely it is that we can afford it and it's going to work for us. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a, as you say, there's quite a range of opportunities, and just having backup batteries is is a good example, and just using less. You know, using, figuring out, you know, buying hyper, you know, super efficient appliances and just figuring out ways to um, need less uh, and then, then you consume less. And then, you know, it's just a, so it's, it's that self-reliance, you know, starting at, at the ground level is just to need less, consume less, waste less. Yeah, I think that's a, a good theme that you write about frequently, right, is, um, you know, we always talk about producing and all this, but uh, this massive amount of waste, waste in food, waste in, in energy, transportation. Um, so, you know, why not consider more higher efficiency, uh, whether it's through innovation, a new uh, process, business process optimization, perhaps, uh, or just simply conservation um, techniques, you know, in, in different ways. Your thoughts? Right. Um, and I think that one topic that we, sh we really should touch on is um, when we talk about self-reliance, we're also talking about taking control of your assets and your capital, you know, and your skill set, you know, your human capital, your social capital, instead of giving it to some company or the government um, to do what they want with. I mean, it, the, it, the more you control and own, the, um, the, the less exposure you have to um, like we said, globalization and financialization being um, either decaying or, or destabilizing, right? And so if you invest in yourself and in your, in your, um, your, your homestead or your household self-reliance, th these investments will continue to pay going forward um, where you really can't uh, make the same kind of claim about any financial asset as you can about a real world asset you own. Yes, absolutely. That's, that's very good. Um, so we talked about food and transportation. There's also energy. Um, you, you mentioned batteries and charging batteries. So th this is another interesting area for um, self-reliance. I mean, you've got uh, in, in a home, you may have um, uh, potential for for getting a generator uh, now it could be gas powered or could be 
natural gas or um, you know regular gasoline or diesel powered but there's also a new um, trend now in solar generators so so th this is a uh, a box that's usually made uh, with a battery and um, and some other additional electrical equipment in you know like uh, to to make it uh, uh, an output of different uh, electricity it could be dc or ac um, you can also charge uh, these uh, initially in the in the home in an, an electrical outlet or with a solar panel uh, so it's it's quite flexible and it essentially serves the same purpose a, as a solar generator so that this again um, increases self reliance um, of course you might have solar panels for for the house or, or, or wind uh, uh, wind power or wind generators um, and then the the community as well I mean they they can be um, uh, on, on the on the trend right from uh, the transition from fossil fuels to uh, to other forms of electricity energy generation um, you know, w uh, which has an emphasis now on nuclear fission, eventually uh, to be also including nuclear fusion, uh, hydro, um, geothermal is another one. Um, so that, you know, there's a big energy uh, transition happening. Um, and uh, th this this is a whole big, a, a whole new uh, subject that we probably can do a whole podcast on. But yeah, the whole energy crisis especially now happening in europe um you know you you really need a transition uh and a migration strategy to get from you know current state to to a future state you can't do it overnight without a plan so that that's a big uh, problem now uh, you know in terms of the energy crisis uh in europe you, ju you just can't get rid of fossil fuels overnight there needs to be a transition and migration plan yeah you're right. off, Charles. Yeah, and and I think that's that's that fits into our theme of, of, of self reliance because um, I forgot uh, which analyst pointed this out, but he he, he pointed out that an electric vehicle um, it's only as environmentally sound as the source of electricity. So he said an EV in northern China, which relies on burning coal, he said ninety percent of the electricity that's going into your EV is from burning coal. That, that <laughs> so how how environmentally sound is that and the answer is it's not so just having an ev isn't really the answer you know you need to be in a place where you're close to you know um hydroelectric or geothermal or a nuclear plant you know you, you have to have a source to charge your your vehicle that's actually environmentally sound but i also want to mention in fossil fuels like um you know you can have a scooter and again, my whole thing is, it, it, I don't think it's so important that, you know, you say, I'm not going to use any fossil fuels. What's important is you use as little as possible. You use it efficiently. So efficiently. like a really simple motorcycle, um, you know, it uses very little fuel. It takes you anywhere you want to go. And um, so, or even, even, a, 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 even if you're going to have a car, if you have a a cheap, easy to repair, um, high mileage vehicle that's going to last 20 or 30 years. That's actually environmentally sound if you don't have to drive that much. If you've located, um, if you've arranged for remote work, I mean, you know, so my thing is if you need 100 gallons of fuel every week just to survive, um, that's a lot different than if you only need five gallons, right? And, and, and so if you want to structure your life to, to use the least amount of, of fossil fuels, not just to save money or anything, but just because it means you're, you're no longer as dependent on, on the system. And it's a lot easier to find five gallons of fuel than it is to find a hundred gallons, <laughs> you know? So um, that, that's where I think, uh, and, and, and what we're talking about here is, is not like wearing a hair shirt, you know, we're, we're not saying, oh, you have to suffer. Actually, your life is going to improve dramatically the more you take control of, of your health, your energy, your food, your water, um, and, and where you live, you know, your local culture, the more you participate and cooperate with others, your life is going to get so much better. And, and I mentioned in the book that um, the, the green, um, the blue zones, uh, this is a book that came out a while ago, talking about 
where are the communities where humans live um, into great old age, into their 90s, and are still um, quite healthy. And it turns out that, of course, they, they're eating real food. They're, they're participating in their community. They're often growing their own food and sharing it, sharing local wine. You know that, um, And so this is what's naturally healthy to human beings. And so being self-reliant, we're actually um, trying to go back to these um, very basic elements of, of human life, being productive, sharing, um, being part of the community in a productive way. And um, and living in 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 the in the lo in the locale where we live, as opposed to being totally dependent on on uh, goods and services from thousands of miles away. Yeah, wow, great points, and um, you you detail a lot of these points in yesterday's blog post entitled "Chart a Course to Self Reliance." So that's on your blog of twominds.com. And um, you also have a link to the book, uh, Self-Reliance in the 21st Century. Um, and you even include a link to, to read the first chapter for free. There's a PDF there you can download. Um, and I, I like this uh, quote here where you mentioned, self-reliance is a work in progress, not a destination. Yeah, we're, none of us are, are perfect. You know, we all can make steps uh, and, 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 and small steps are add up. You know, you don't have to make any big gigantic uh, change. You can just make incremental improvements. And that, that's, um, that's the philosophy I'm promoting. Well, great. It's been an insightful discussion. Thank you very much, Charles. And again, the book is entitled Self-Reliance in the 21st Century by Charles Hugh Smith. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Richard. I appreciate you um, taking the time to discuss my new book. Awesome. Thank you so much. The FRA Roundtable Insight Show is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be considered as a solicitation or offer to purchase or sell any securities. The investments, investment strategies, and investment philosophies discussed or presented on the show each involve their own unique risk factors which are not discussed on the show. Any discussions among the panel participants or responses to listener inquiries are based on the personal opinions of the panel participants and do not take into consideration the listener's suitability, objectives, or risk tolerance. Please be advised that you invest or speculate at your own risk.